thank you so much for having me here. Um, so today I'm going to tell you about graphlets. It's a semi-parametric uh, method for, an, for the analysis of large social and information networks with edge weights. So I'm going to start with the dichotomy. Um, when people talk about network and structured data, uh, they usually mean one of two things. Uh, on one hand, uh, they mean structured data. And on the other hand, they may mean, uh, well, there's a graph involved in my project. However, the graph is capturing some latent dependence structure. Uh, so here in this talk, I'm going to observe structure, OK? And the goal of the game is I'm going to leverage observed noisy structure to estimate some quantities that are going to have or to which I'm going to attach some social meaning. Uh, and in this talk, the structure is, is expressed by a graph. <clears throat> and the graph has edge weights. They're typically integer, but they could be just positive. Um, there's some challenges here. And the challenges are that um, the measurements are uh, taken on pairs of units rather than on individual units. Uh, and that's something that introduces some interesting statistical difficulties. Um, and I'll talk about that. Um, and the goals uh, for this particular project um, are threefold. So on one hand, we wanted uh, an expressive, interpretable model. Okay, there's plenty of models out there, and there's several models that are actually expressive. They're good for data analysis. Um, we also wanted a model uh, that we could fit quickly. So this is a project that started in collaboration with Facebook. So we have in mind very large networks, quite sparse networks. And uh, there's a challenge here uh, of how to deal with zeros, with non-edges. And I'll talk about that. <clears throat> and uh, one of our goal was also we wanted a model that was expressive and scalable for which we could develop some theory. Because in general, uh, there's a lot of models for networks out there, statistical models, but there's little theory about them. And so that's uh, what I'm going to try and accomplish. We call this method graphlets. Um, so I guess the scientific problem is how to quantify social information. Um, it is a representation problem, so how to translate the social structure into social uh, information. Um, the technical challenges for this semi-parametric approach is that we're going to, in the classical statistical uh, sense, we're going to have uh, a model that depends on a set of bases, and we want this basis to be interpretable. And so we're going to give up some orthogonality constraints among the bases, uh, and we're going to have a new set of constraints, um, which I won't actually talk about uh, too much, but they're in the paper. Uh, basically, the basis will be uh, linearly independent in some special space, <clears throat> so that the basis that will correspond to subgraphs will not be too, will not have too much of an overlap. Um, and theoretically, we have a very large number of business elements. And so the challenge is we don't want to, uh, we actually want to learn a few relevant business elements from data. OK, so that's, um, that's the idea. And the basis encode, if you want, this notion of multiple membership or multi-scale membership. And you will see that in a second. Uh, OK, so my. My object, my observation is, is a weighted graph as n nodes. And we have an adjacency matrix with integer entries we call D. Um, and the matrix, you know, you can imagine in the application that I'm going to present later on, is just going to be uh, the number of um, social interactions on Facebook among users, both, both public and private. Um, and we accumulate them over a period of three months. OK, so <clears throat> what do we want? We want a model um, of network structure for which groups are going to be a function of some unobservable properties. And the properties are binary factors. And they will induce uh, uh, groups at multiple scales. And I guess one um, technical 
sort of uh, trick that we are leveraging here is that there's a duality between binary factors and cliques in the graph. Okay, so keep that, keep that in mind. All right, so the basic graph like model is very simple. Um, entries, integer entries of my adjacency matrix are IID Poisson, and all the work, all the compression, if you want, uh, happens uh, at the level of the rates. We have an M by N adjacency matrix. We have an M by N uh, rate matrix lambda. <clears throat> and this matrix capital B is the binary factor matrix, has N rows, one row for each um, individual, and has K columns. And it's binary and it is sparse. And M is this um, um, K by K matrix, is diagonal. And on each element of the diagonal, there's a weight that is going to tell you how much the particular basis is going to contribute to the overall traffic. And you can assume an arbitrary distribution on K, or in general, we actually just learn it um, from the data without you know, assuming anything particular. Um, OK, so. Um, the model is pretty simple, but I will still say a few things about it. Um, so n nodes are represented as bit strings of length k. That's what I mean by uh, a, fact, a binary factor graph model. Um, the duality means that each one of these bits is capable of inducing a subgraph. And so if you have k binary factors, there should be k groups or k cliques in your graph. They can be mildly overlapping, as I said before. These, uh, these subgraphs are what I'm going to call the basis elements uh, that I use to define my model. And they can be overlapping. They're non-orthogonal. And so in that sense, we, we depart from a lot of the literature on this topic. Um, and mathematically, we have a dual representation. So as I wrote before, you can look at the lambda matrix as B, M, B transpose. Or you can also rewrite the lambda matrix as the sum over my k basis elements of mu i, which is the diagonal element that tells me how much traffic, how much uh, connectivity is there uh, coming out of basis element i. And this P i of B is just um, the projection of my binary matrix onto, onto the space, onto the graph space. And so it's a binary graph of size n by n. OK. OK. So <clears throat> we, we leverage this duality between binary graphs and, um, and um, sorry, between binary factors and cliques in order to make inferences. So I think this is a nice trick. It can work if your graph is sparse. So instead of doing inference in a very classical statistical fashion, for example, maximum likelihood, we do we developed a, or we are working with a two-stage inference procedure. Okay, so the way this stage, the, the two stages work, is that in the first stage I'm almost going to find B. In fact, I'm going to find a matrix B prime that contains B. Okay, and I can prove that the matrix I'm going to find actually contains B, and I can prove things. Uh, useful facts. For example, I can show that, in general, the number of column of this matrix B prime is twice as much as the number of col or is, is the same order of magnitude as the number of columns in B, and in practice is twice as much, or, or you have twice as many columns. So how does the first stage work? It's very simple. You can, you know, if you imagine uh, your, your adjacency matrix with integer uh, weights uh, on the y-axis. You just threshold the weights at very different level. Every time you do a thresholding operation, you get a binary graph. And you, you look for maximal cliques in this sequence of binary graph that corresponds to this sequence of threshold operations. Okay? I'm going to have an illustration in a second. Uh, but that's the first stage. And then the second stage, you just do maximum likelihood. But the nice trick was that I started with uh, a, an n by n adjacency matrix. And since this matrix B prime has the same order 
uh, has, this, has the number of column in the same, same order of magnitude as the true number of column. Um, I basically reduced my dimensionality from n square to 2k, okay, in practice. And so that's magic, <laughs> right? So that was useful. But that only works, of course. What I'm not telling you is that we're using the Bronckerbosch algorithm to find maximal clicks. And uh, you know, if the graph is dense, well, this operation is no longer cheap, and so it won't work very well. But it, it, at the end, it's an empirical question. On Facebook graphs, they're very sparse, and so uh, the operation is actually very useful. OK, and then I'm going to do maximum likelihood estimation. So here's an illustration. OK, so on the left-hand side, I start with three clicks. And uh, um, there's a number of messages, let's say, that people in these clicks uh, exchange. One message in the green click, two messages in the red click, and three messages in the blue click. So that's you know, generating some data from my model. I, I put them all together. So what I would observe is this uh, graph over here. And so the thresholding operations, the first stage of inference I told you about before, are depicted next. If I threshold at uh, 4, I get a triangle. If I threshold at 3, I get a triangle and, and an edge, and so on and so forth. So at the end, I get the, a candidate, uh, a set of candidate bases, which will correspond to this B prime matrix, correspond to the binary factor matrix expanded somewhat. Then I do EM only on the candidate set of bases, which I've been saying it's the right order of magnitude, then it's much, much uh, lower order of magnitude than the actual data. And I can prove that I can estimate consistently um, the weights. So there's some theory. Well, so we, we can prove a, a few things, for example, um, and for this, you really have to go and read the papers, but I thought I would at least uh, mention the type of results that, that you, you can expect. So um, we can compute the complexity, which is how large is the set of candidate bases you can expect. And in certain asymptotic regimes, you can expect the redundancy, which is the ratio between the true number of bases and the number of bases the number of candidate bases I get at the end of the first stage of the inference is order one. And in practice, uh, like I said before, the number of candidate bases is about twice as much um, as the true number of bases. Scalability, you can do uh, some analysis about it. And in practice, in theory, we can prove that um, fitting this algorithm is linear, it has a complexity that's linear in the number of positive edge weights. So when you compute the likelihood, that means you never have to touch any of the zeros, which in some applications may be a problem because zeros may be informative. But on Facebook, we decided the zeros are not that informative, and so we threw them all away. And uh, so in, in practice, uh, we've only um, looked at networks, sub-networks of Facebook after size several millions. And it seemed to be sublinear, but that's an empirical observation. Anyway, that, I guess the message is this is a very fast and scalable technique. So we achieved the second goal. Um, and then you can, also, um, you can also prove something about what's the expected accuracy if you now want to do compression. What do I mean by that? Well, let's say that I know or I estimate that um, I need k bases to reconstruct exactly my graph, uh, my weighted graph. Then uh, I can ask, well, what if I use the 10% of these bases? What's the expected accuracy? The expected accuracy turns out to be a simple function of the sparsity of this binary factor matrix. Okay, And this theorem just leverages some known results about um, order statistics of a gamma distribution. So it's nothing really new, but the good thing is um, you can actually prove accuracy theoretically. I'm going to show you uh, a couple of empirical results. Well, this is uh, a simulation that shows that 
the theoretical accuracy, the estimated theoretical accuracy is actually a pretty good estimate. Um, so we also wanted to, so I'm gonna make an aside. So this is a method to, to analyze weighted graphs. There's a lot of methods out there for analyzing binary graphs. And we wanted to compare uh, how good we are or you know, how, how powerful this method is if, you know, when compared to this other method for binary graph. And so although these two methods are quite different, we developed a, a small simulation to try and understand how well we would do at doing link predictions. So uh, that's what this table is about. And so the, the method here, graphlet, where there's a percentage in parentheses that tell you how many bases I'm actually using for this particular uh, example. So this is a graphlet decomposition with 25% of the estimated optimal number of bases. The runtime is obviously constant for, because you first feed the method and then you just throw away some bases. And you can see that the accuracy is pretty good. Uh, this, unfortunately, is on, uh, on denser graphs than I would want. Um, and, you know, it, it, the, the, I guess, um, the message here is that they, we're, we're competitive with other methods, although I will say we're not trying to do link prediction. This is just as an aside. Uh, then we did some analysis of um, Facebook colleges, just because our collaborator were interested in um, doing some, in using graphlets, uh, not as an end, but as a mean to generate covariates that then they could try and correlate with an outcome. For example, amount of time spent online. So you can imagine fitting graphlets to very many uh, colleges, and then you, you're going to use the graphlet coefficients for each college as covariates in a regression, for example. Okay? Um, and I guess what, what you can see here, uh, columns, again, 10%, 25% is how many bases we're using. And here empirically, you see using 10% of the bases, um, you already. Uh, achieve about less than 10% error in, uh, in reconstructed the networks. Okay, and we did some analysis of criminal associations, which um, I won't tell you about, I guess, in the interest of time. And I think what one, one particular set of results that is intriguing to me is, uh, since we're using, we're representing individuals in terms of binary strings, can we bring to bear, or can we extract from that representation a notion of social information? Okay, since we are learning these binary strings on the fly. And uh, so this is, these are two simulations. What we did is we're comparing the singular value decomposition of a weighted adjacency matrix with the graphlet decomposition of a weighted adjacency matrix. And we are doing that on two sets of graphs. One is a real blocky graph and one is um, a Nerdos-Rheni random graph, okay? And so on the left-hand side, I'm showing you the coefficient, and on the right-hand side, I'm showing you the reconstruction error. And if you look at the coefficient, what these plots remind me of, remind me of um, the, the comparison between um, a Fourier decomposition of, of a one-dimensional time series and a wavelet decomposition of a one-dimensional time series, right? So in, in this case, the free decomposition would be the S, would correspond to the SVD, and graphlets would correspond to wavelet. And so in an erdos rheni random graph where there is no, arguably there is no real information in, in the connectivity because it's completely random, uh, graphlet, this would be the bottom, pa the bottom panels, uh, the graphlet's coefficient are spread all over the place where SVD always finds some signal. Whereas if you, if you, if you analyze a real blocky graph that contains some social information, then uh, very few coefficients in the graphlet, 30% of the coefficients in the graphlet decomposition um, are positive and the rest are all zero. And again, the SVD always finds something, right? And then uh, on the other hand, you can see that this is mirrored, this sort of is mirror, this sort of result is mirrored in the, in the actual reconstruction. Uh, and so maybe there is a notion of social information lurking in the output of this model. 
and this is something that we like. Um, so I'm just going to wrap up very quickly. So uh, the properties, again, is that the bases are interpretable in terms of membership. Uh, they are, um, they are non-orthogonal, uh, but uh, we can achieve interpretability with non-orthogonal bases. And they are, again, they're non-orthogonal. They still, there's still a technical condition on the set of bases. Um, they're linearly independent in some space. The estimation algorithm is fast. Um, in practice, they seem to be accurate. And um, we actually can prove some theoretical guarantees. And um, work in progress here. So I told you before, we're ignoring all the zeros. If now we're thinking of adapting graphlets to a situation in which some of the, the zeros may be informative. And so the question is, how do we do that? Because a lot of uh, the nice properties that this method have has are tied to the fact that we're throwing away the zeros. And so I guess take on points, just more in general, paired measurements or analysis of network raise a lot of interesting statistical problems. And I, I haven't told you about this in this talk, but in general, familiar notion of sampling variability and sampling design are challenged. And Graphlet has some theoretical guarantees and is useful in practice. Uh, and there's a paper that you can, that you can go and read. It's appeared on AI stats. And there's a survey if you're more interested in reading more about statistical models of networks. And that this is work that was in collaboration with Facebook and AT&T. And it's been done uh, mostly by my student, Hossein Azari. Thank you. Yes, the question is, am I assuming that the matrix is a positive semi-definite? And I guess, um, uh, no, I'm not assuming that. I'm, I'm assuming that, uh, I mean, I'm, I'm just uh, analyzing any symmetric, symmetric matrix, OK? The approximation may be positive semi-definite, but the data that you, that you get can be anything. There's a distinction there. Thank you. Thank you very much.